Good afternoon and welcome to this week's episode of Safety Culture Solutions, brought to you by Safety Culture Strategies. I'm Mike Kinney, your host. Throughout the weeks, we have practitioners of safety, PhDs, owners of companies, talking about all these different myriad of topics that support having a positive safety culture. And today we are pleased to have with us from down in the Florida way, so it's raining a little bit today for him, since well, we're kind of envious being in Nevada, we have Mr. Ron Carr with us. And Ron has worked with leaders of organizations on six continents to eliminate risk, gain buy-in, and achieve better results faster with the velocity mindset. For the past 30 years, Ron Carr's presentation and advisory services have generated over $1 billion in incremental revenue for his clients. Ron is the author of five books, including his latest, Velocity Mindset, and the bestseller, Lead seller, get out of the way. He has been interviewed on Fox News, CBS Morning Show, Bloomberg TV, BBC, and hundreds of radio stations. His articles have appeared in over 250 national publications. Ron is also the facilitator of the prestigious CROs, that is Chief Revenue, Revenue Officer Minds, Mastermind Group, made up of CEOs and VPs of high-growth companies looking to build high-performance sales cultures. Ron served as the 2013-2014 President of National Speakers Association, as well as an advisor to several board of directors. And Ron, it's great to have you on the show with us today. Welcome aboard, as we like to say here in Vegas land. How are you doing today? I'm fine, Mike, and I'm glad to be aboard. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, we're going to kind of jump in the pool because always with like learned individuals like yourself as a featured guest, I like to talk about strategies and what leaders should look at. I want to learn, before I do that, I want to learn a lot more about velocity mindset, kind of what it is and why I should care, because it does sound cool. So, Mike, when you hear the word velocity, what's the first word that comes to your mind? Acceleration. Acceleration. And a lot of people say that speed or movement. Mm -hmm. And you're right, but that's only part definition. Okay. If that's all you think velocity is, then you're probably not going to achieve velocity. You're probably going to achieve burnout. Or in the case of safety, you're probably going to have an unsafe environment. Very good. Very good. The real definition of velocity is speed with direction. Ah, okay. So, for example, if you're in the Las Vegas airport and you want to come down to visit me and you want to go to Fort Lauderdale, and you ask the pilot where we're going, and he or she says, I have no clue wherever the winds take us, <laughs> would you stay on that plane? I think I think I would deep plane rather quickly. <laughs> you would deep plane rather quickly, right? Here's what the pilots do. They start with the end in sight first. So they want to go from Las Vegas to Fort Lauderdale. They start with Fort Lauderdale. And they work their way back and they say, okay, what are the three or four waypoints Places that if I know I hit them, I know I'm on my way to Fort Lauderdale. Cool. Then I take into account the storms that are coming, the winds, right. and they develop a flight plan that at the end gives them the safest and fastest way to get to where they want to be. In other words, all decisions and all tasks are all geared towards one thing, the purpose of landing in Fort Lauderdale. The That's problem okay. in today's world mm -hmm. is that everybody is task driven, but not purpose driven. They're so busy and checking the boxes and making sure they're doing all these things that at the end of the day, they're exhausted because they're doing it with speed. But then when they realize they haven't really moved the needle or accomplished what they wanted, that's when they get the burnout because Good they point. weren't sure. driven by the direction, the purpose. They were letting any task drive their actions. Wow. So it's interesting, Mike, when you talk about safety, that's the biggest issue with safety. Yes. Safety is not about checking boxes. Right. Safety is where everybody's buying into the end result and working in their way backwards and saying, what are the key things that have to happen? So at the end of the day, we land this plane in a safe manner and we don't have any accidents. Absolutely. Fascinating. So what are like three results that someone could expect from practicing and learning from you and your team about this really interesting approach for velocity mindset? A, they're more than likely going to achieve their results. 
B, they're going to do it faster. And C, they're probably going to achieve more than they ever thought was possible. Huh. Okay, so kind of pulling the string because this is, you and I have chatted before and communicate. I'm getting really intrigued. So what is the art of the pause? I, I just like the title of it. You know? Well, you know, we think that, you know, if, if you were to slow down or stop, you're going to screw up your velocity. In fact, okay. that's the opposite. In fact, you'll probably gain velocity if you sometimes stopped in life and rethought what it is you're trying to do. In fact, COVID made all of us stop with the lockdown. And what happened was we all started reevaluating the end result that we're after, realizing that life is maybe not as we all thought it would be. And people started changing what they were really after and started making some really game changing decisions in their life because they stopped. It was a forced stop. But I learned this at an early age, Mike. And my first job was selling copiers. Okay? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and so I'm dating myself here, okay? It was 1980. <laughs> and it was, it was right at the, there was, there was a revolution going on in the copier business. I know okay. for young kids today, they're going to think I'm nuts. But just, <laughs> just play along with me, okay? In 1980, the revolution was that they came out with the first plain bond copier, dry toner. What a novel idea. No more <laughs> liquid that gets all over your clothes, right? Right, right. right. So Royal Business Machines was seducing me with this cool-ass copier <laughs> that can do 15 crisp copies and no longer destroy your clothes. Wow. And I said, where's, where's the collator? Oh, don't worry about it. I'll be here in six months. Where's the duplicator? Don't worry about it. I'll be here in six months. Yeah. But I, they, they seduced me, so I took the job. <laughs> and the first two months, I didn't sell one machine. I kept going out there talking to office managers, and mm -hmm. the first thing they said when they knew I was signing copies, the first thing they asked me was, well, can you collate? Like the big machine on the third floor, the Xerox. Uh, not exactly. Can you duplicate? Uh, not exactly. <laughs> Tell you what, come back when you can, okay? Mike, after the door hit me so many times in the oh, yeah. butt on the way out in those yeah. two months, and I had a sore butt, <laughs> I realized something had to change. Okay. So I stopped. I paused. And I had what I called as a board meeting with myself. Me, myself, and I. There you go. And when do you go for a board meeting in New Jersey? You go to the diner. <laughs> of course. So I went to the diner. And we're sitting down there over coffee, and I start asking myself, okay, what are you doing? What's going on? I need to make money. I'm not selling a machine. Well, what's the conversation? What are you selling? I'm selling a copy. What happens when you tell them that? They compare me to Xerox and I can't compete. So, you know, what does a copy do? I asked myself when I said, well, it's really a communication vehicle. And I said, well, maybe I need to change the conversation. So I went back on my next call to an office manager and I asked her this one question. I said, would you agree with me that a copy is nothing more than a communication vehicle? She goes, absolutely. And I said, well, when it comes to a copy of being a communication vehicle, what are your three biggest challenges? And Mike, it was almost like she was sitting in the therapist's office and laying down on the couch. She goes, oh, we need to talk. Okay. Bruce or Sally has to make one copy on the first floor. They get up by the time they walk to the staircase, chit chatting to everybody. They go up to the third floor. Now they're gonna wait behind all these big jobs. And by the time they make that one uh, copy and get, get back down copy. to the desk, yep. it can take two hours. Right. So how often does this happen? And she Good goes, point. try the equivalent of two full-time employees. Wow. I said, how would you let those two full-time employees back? She goes, how are you gonna do that? I got so it look, I'm not here to compete mm -hmm. with that big machine on the third floor. It's a great machine. Keep using it. I'm here to fill in your gaps. All right. I'm here to give you back those two full-time employees. You should be putting one of my machines on every floor to do those one and two copy jobs. Perfect. And you'll get back those two full-time employees. And they won't have to go on those two-hour excursions every two hours. She bought three that day. Three. <laughs> I started cool. selling multiple machines at once <laughs> after that day <clears throat> because I realized something and that became the premise for my previous book you mentioned, Lead, Sell, Get Out of the Way. Right. The premise was don't compete, create. Everybody wants to compete. What's my competitor doing? Forget about your competitor. 
Find out the gaps that your customers are still having and fill in those gaps. Perfect. Excellent. That's the art of the pause. Out of the pause. And in safety, that's important. Absolutely. In so, safety, you have to pause often to see what are we doing, what's not working, and how do we do it differently? Because at the end of the day, if we could keep doing the same thing, someone's likely about to get hurt. And get hurt. I work with some of my clients, we'll call it a timeout. Just you take a pause, just not a big stop work. And have I got all the right tools, the PPE? Is my are my work instructions clear? So Yeah, exactly. So so I gotta ask with you know, you've had a lot on your plate and you've done a lot of really cool stuff. So what kind of led you to formulating th this whole velocity mindset? Well, it's interesting. You know, we all go through our great times and our not so great times. So I had some really challenging times in my life, but one of them was um when I was done being president of the National Speakers Association in 2014, I had nine surgeries in <clears> three <throat> years, mostly on my back. Wow. You know how Tiger Woods had one level fused in his back? Yeah. I had nine levels fused. Whew. And I still play golf today. But during those three years, it was hell. I mean, I couldn't speak. I was off the circuit. I was doing sure. some consulting. But, you know, you're sitting there on pain pills and I'm thinking about your life and I thought about my successes. I had great successes. But I thought about the things I didn't get to. And when I looked at why I didn't get them, it was simple. It was because of my limiting stories that prevented me from going after that. And at that time, I was 57. I started thinking to myself, what a shame it would be to end my life right now. My life ended. And I never got there because of limiting stories. So I hired a film crew after I got back on my feet that did a lot of speaker videos. And this uh, producer, I said, look, I want you to do my new scissor wheel, mm -hmm. but I need to rebrand myself. I'm losing my passion as a leader and sales expert. So I went to do a keynote at the University of Texas. He came down and filmed me. And the next day he calls me up and goes, I got your brand. I go, what? He goes, Velocity Mindset. Mm -hmm. And it just hit me between the eyes. I said, how'd you come up with that? He goes, dude, I didn't come up with that. You did. It's all you talk about. Really? As a matter of fact, I researched all your materials. You've been writing about it for the last 10 years when I think <laughs> about it. And what my differentiating value was, yeah, so it was helping my clients get to where they needed to be in a faster way than they were doing it themselves. It was all about velocity. Okay. But now it took on a different meaning for me. Because as I was 57, now I'm 65. Mm -hmm. As I was 57 at that time, you know, I'm, I'm on the back nine of my life. <laughs> Good point. I was getting short. <laughs> so, you know, am I going to let those limiting stories still stop me from getting to where I want to be? I better get going. So what really came apparent to me is I have a new passion in life. My new passion in life is simply to help everybody in life get to where they want to be sooner or later and never, ever have to wake up after a period of time being depressed or upset because they didn't get to where they wanted to be because of limiting stories or things that got in the way and they didn't know how to get over that. Wow. So that's my new passion, helping people live with a velocity mindset. Now, it's technically a leadership book. Sure. And the subtitle is helping leaders eliminate resistance, gain buy-in and achieve results faster, better results. But the premise of the book is this book is for everybody, not just anybody who has a leadership or a manager's title. Because mm -hmm. the premise is, what would the world look like if everybody acted like a leader oh, cool. and not as a victim of circumstance? Really? And in the book, okay. we talk about that the first thing a leader does when something doesn't go right, the first thing that they do, instead of blaming anybody or anything else, the first question they ask is of themselves. Perfect. What could Perfect. I do differently next time? Perfect. And in safety, that's a critical question to be asking. Absolutely. I mean, what would your organizations that rely on you to help them learn how to do safety and, and have safer environments, what mm -hmm. would those organizations look like if everybody, when something happened, instead of blaming somebody or something, they all started asking themselves, what could I do differently next time Beautiful. to contribute to a better result? 
So, so how so safe would those organizations be? Exactly. I think very safe. And I think we're touching on there is that personal accountability. You own the discussion. And then how can I personally make a difference on the next evolution? And then having leaders that in lieu of blaming the worker, which are honest, you can appreciate it still does happen on occasion. Why did you allow yourself to get hurt? If they have the courage, let's look at the systems and the systems start with me as a leader. Right. Or even was everybody buying into the outcome? Did they understand what the outcome was? There you are. Absolutely. Did they understand the imp impacts of the outcome was not achieved? I mean, you know, a lot of people, very few employees come to work to intentionally blow up the company. Exactly correct. But many employees have no clue what their contributions do for the company. <laughs> yes. You're Positive or negative. Yeah, the, the, they just show up and kind of punch the proverbial time clock, right? To, we're right. Gonna, right we're so, going to take a quick pause. We're going to be right back. We're going to be talking a whole bunch more about velocity mindset with Ron Carr and kind of how it influx, influences leaders' decisions and what it's going to look like when they're done. Stand by. We'll be right back. Safety Culture Strategies provides world-class safety culture and safety program management consultative services for clients throughout the United States. Whether your company is pursuing Voluntary Protection Program star designation, ISO 45001 certification, or considering a comprehensive review of your current safety programs and processes, Safety Culture Strategies brings hands-on experience combined with a unique perspective that readily translates from senior your management to task level personnel. This collective skill set provides you with a very insightful health check of your overall safety management system that can also assist with reducing injuries and attrition, as well as increasing profitability. Safety Culture Strategies is also certified to provide Ziegler Institute employee engagement training and leadership coaching. When combined with established relationships with federal and state regulators, Safety Culture Strategies is uniquely position to assist the safety culture efforts of any company. For additional information, visit www.scstrat.com or call us at 702-780-1410. After all, every company has a safety culture, but is it the culture you want? Well, I'd be, I got to be kind of candid. First stuff I want, I want to learn more what goes on with Ron Carr and this amazing process of a velocity mindset. And one of the other topics we've chatted about before, sir, is the role of intuition and how does that really help in all this? And, and, and your face is lighting up on that one, so I think you got some insight for us, I bet. So um, in the early 90s when I was president of the national of the New York chapter of the National Speaker Association, there was a colleague of mine there and she was an intuition expert. And I always thought, how does she make a living with that? <laughs> and I was arrogant. And, uh, and she was trying to tell me about the benefits of intuition. At that time, I was just too young and arrogant. I said, yeah, it's, it's too fluff. Well, it always stayed with me and I realized it was not as fluff. And as I studied it, what is intuition? Intuition is nothing more than the subconscious in which everything you know about yourself and about the world to be is all stored there. Your likes, your dislikes, what you know you're willing to do, not willing to do, all that stuff. And so deep down, we kind of know what we want to do, don't want to do, what we should do, not do. But we're not willing to trust our intuition. So there's two parts to influence in the body, the heart and the mind. Now, if you have to make a decision and, and you're debating, is it the right decision, not the right decision, and you're going back and forth, that's a mindful conversation. You know? For salespeople, it's when they're doing all the benefits as to why someone, the features of why someone should buy. The heart is the emotional connection. So number one, we always want to lead with the heart because that's the emotion, that's where the passion is, but that's also where your intuition is down here. So when I ask somebody, what does your intuition tell you? Hmm. I remind them about the heart and the mind. I say, if you're really speaking from your intuition, it should come immediately from here. You shouldn't have to think for one second. The answer should be coming flying out. If you roll your eyes up or you pause and you're thinking, you're up here. Got it. Okay. 
the furthest part away from your intuition. So I wrote about the intuition in the, uh, in the, in the velocity mindset. And last September, a year ago, September, I handed in the manuscript and, uh, COVID, you know, I lost a lot of money from the surgeries and, and then COVID up, I did my speaking business like I did to everybody else. So we all had to pivot. And initially my plan from losing the money in the surgeries was, Hey, I'll fly around to them 70, make all the, do all the keynote speeches, make the money back and live a good life after that. Well, COVID, I said, well, wait a minute, why do you have to wait till you're 70? You don't know how long you have left. Why don't you live life the way you want to live it now? You can redesign your business. There's a virtual component. So why wait till 70 if you want to move to Florida because you can't stand the cold? Why not move now? So a year ago, September, I flew down, rented it. I uh, took a lease on an apartment, mm -hmm. went back home to New Jersey. And as I handed in the manuscript, my intuition spoke to me and said, you know, you've been dealing with this heart murmur all your life, your aorta valve. It's been getting tighter and tighter. You better go back to your cardiologist and do another test before you really move down there because you may not be moving. Good point. Very good. That was point. my intuition. So initially I said, ah, oh, come on, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> you know, like we all do, right? Yeah. Just rub a little then, dirt on it. You'll be all right. <laughs> yeah. And then I said to myself, dude, you just wrote about this. Very good. If you're not willing to walk your talk, what gives you the right to publish the book? So I went to my cardiologist and he did the test and he pulled the fire along. He goes, you're not going anywhere. Wow. Go, what are you talking about? He goes, that aorta valve is so tight right now that at best you got two years left and you could die suddenly in six months. You need to fix this now. Wow. You're like, whoa. Yeah. So all of a sudden, cancel the lease that I just signed. You know, I, was, I, I, I wrote about the surgeon in the introduction of the book. We wrote, we wrote the introduction to the great surgeon. I was in great hands in New York. They did a surgery. It was great. I'm in the best cardiac shape. There was no artery disease. So cool. I'm actually doing things I couldn't do before. Excellent. And, uh, and then after the surgery, you know, five months later, I, uh, found another place in Florida and Boynton beach and moved down here. Nice. But that's what intuition's about. And, and we talk about this in a book. I had a mentor, um, Paul Domingos who kept saying to me, you gotta learn to listen, trust and act on the inner self, listen, trust, and act. So when the intuition is, is there, you gotta listen to it, not poo poo it like I was trying to do. You gotta trust it and you should trust it because the intuition is nothing more than all of your experiences, what you know the world to be, not to be, what you know about yourself to be, not to be, what you know you're willing to do, not willing to do. And then you gotta act. And I learned that from Domingo, from Paul Dominguez. And it was a very valuable lesson that I learned in life. And so, you know, so you get this idea from the intuition. Are you listening? Are you trusting it? And are you acting on it? If you're not, then you're really losing out on life. I think you're kind of discounting, like you say, all that knowledge and wealth of expertise you've gained as a, you've been going through your life. Okay, kind of a bigger picture question for you. Dealt with a lot of companies on many processes for them, including their sales programs. When I look at it like from a safety culture perspective, is it possible to actually measure improvements in your safety culture? Or is it more kind of organic in nature, kind of like art, you know, when you see it? That's a great question. Um, so the answer is yes, <laughs> but it depends on what you're looking to measure. Very good. So uh, if you're just looking at safety accidents, um, th that's the end result. You know, that's all you're measuring. Uh, it's too late when you have an accident. You should be measuring, you know, the telltale signs of safety, right? Mm -hmm. How you think, you know, how you're making decisions. What are you looking for? So, uh, so a safety culture is, is not about when, when the accident happens, a safety culture is a proactive environment. A safety culture is where everybody is thinking about the end result first. And then every time they do an action they're saying, is this really supporting the safety culture we have? If not, what do I need to do differently? 
the key part to any safety culture is starting with the end in sight first. Perfect. Meaning the end result before you do an action, then asking yourself, is this the right action that's going to help me get there in the safest manner possible? Right on target. And uh, some organizations that they'll have, almost everybody, Ron, has some version of a plan of the day or tailgate safety briefing. And what I've come to realize, especially I've been featured guests with all this talent like yourself, some of those briefings or discussions, they're really powerful. They're insightful. Other ones, you know, you and I'm sitting in the back of the corner, sitting or coffee, just waiting for the meeting to be over because we were never really engaged to begin with. And part of that is we had the impression our foreman, superintendent, the big boss, they really don't care. Right. Now, what you don't know okay. is I was an EMT. Really? Emergency medical technician. Wow. Volunteer in New Jersey before I hurt my back. God bless you. And, um... When we took the EMT program, emergency medical technician was a big program, like over 120 hours that included textbook, you know, on infield and ER and all that. And when you had the final test, there was two tests, the written okay. and then the practical. Mm -hmm. In the practical, you're in the gym, a lot of mats, a lot of mannequins, a lot of room. Room you don't have in the accident scene. Right. Okay. And you were being drilled and, and tested on to see if you could perform and do it right. Okay. Now they were looking for the ABCs, air, airway, breathing, and circulation. Mm -hmm. If you did anything to circumvent those three things, you failed in a heartbeat. Now you had all the room there and all the mats, you had all the room to go around and do everything, What you don't have on the scene of an accident. Good point. All right. But the reason why they drilled you with all that room and failed you with one little mistake is because no matter what, you could not compromise the ABCs, airway, breathing, and circulation. So now you get to a scene of a real accident, an old Volkswagen Beetle, very small car, wrapped yeah. around a telephone pole, chest is compressed into, I mean, the, the steering wheel is compressed into a chest. This is before they had airbags. Right. And now all of a sudden you get your call to the scene. You can't even maneuver inside that car. The chest is compressed. All right. You don't have all that room in the gym when you were doing the ABCs. Mm -hmm. But because the training was so severe and so stringent. Yep. It made you think that no matter what you did, no matter what, uh, tools you use or what you had to do to make up for the lack of space and everything, what you mm -hmm. had to improvise, sure. no matter what you did, you did not put in danger the ABCs, the airway, breathing, and circulation. That's what that Fast. training taught you. Wow. So it becomes right. yeah, not necessarily automatic, but it's somewhat rote and you keep it as a priority. Okay. Before we get to the end of the show, cause I knew time was going to fly by. If you had one strategy that that C-suite leadership regarding a positive safety culture, they could practice every day of the week. What do you think that would be? Well, number one, um, communicate to every worker, how important they are cool. and what a safe environment means to the leadership of the organization, not just to save the money, but how they value each and everybody's lives. And how they want everybody to value each and everybody's life in that organization. So they make and it when they, they make, make it personal. Yeah. And when they make decisions to do something, is that what they would want to have done if their life was in the balance? I like it. Okay, before we get done, you'd mentioned the National Speaker Association. I'm a big fan. I've been a member of the chapter here in Las Vegas. Good stuff. So you've spoken somewhere in the world, in your case, and you're done. They're chanting their, your name. They want to take you to dinner. They want to buy you three rounds of golf. They're so excited of, of listening to you. But when you get done, what's two or three things you hope they write down and take back to their companies? to make a difference with their safety culture? It's going to be different for each of them. I want them to write down the one, two or three things that hit them between the eyes that they know that if they brought it back to their company, it will make a huge difference. 
So that way it's, it's tailored to who they are, if, if you will. Yes, and, and they're more likely to do action on it. Ooh, I like it because they've heard you talk about the velocity mindset and, and making sure to kind of follow your intuition and say, okay, so that kind of decodes it, what it means to me and my company. Well, it decodes it, what it means to them and their company, but at the end of the day, they got to really want it. So what's yeah. the outcome that they're looking to achieve and how Perfect. is that going to help them achieve that outcome? Perfect. And that's a pretty good takeaway as well. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes this episode. And Ron, we can't thank you enough for being on the show. Before we say goodbye, how do people get a hold of you? Well, if they go to velocitymindset.com, okay. that's velocitymindset.com, they can actually do a five-minute question survey that can uh, show them, you know, on when it comes to velocity, how they think in certain areas and how can they think differently to give them more speed. Ooh. But more importantly, it actually comes with tips and ideas on how they can do it differently. So it's all free of charge Perfect. if they go to velocitymindset.com. They will also ask them for the email address. Why? Sure. Because we send out videos every Friday on the Velocity Mindset and they get different perspectives from different people cool. on how they can look at things differently. And then finally, if they want to get the book, The Velocity Mindset, they can go to Amazon and purchase it. Perfect. Well, Ron Carr and Velocity Mindset, thank you so much for being on the show today. Enjoy your weather in Florida, <laughs> the beats being kind of like New York City. And thank you again, sir. And you have a great weekend. Bye-bye for now. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that includes this week's episode of Safety Culture Solutions, brought to you by Safety Culture Strategies. Every once in a while, I says, Mike, how can we find you? And I said, well, thank you. You can go to my website, www.scstrat.com. You can send me an email. I make it easy, mike at scstrat.com. Or give me a holler at the office, 702-780-1410. You will talk to a genuine person versus some prompts where you have to go through a whole bunch of steps. Until next time and enjoy your safety culture journey. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye for now.